folks here in the audience. Um, today's program is a, a program that uh, I think uh, developed almost uh, on the spot. Uh, Faye and I were at a meeting uh, uh, a couple months back, and uh, we uh, it was a meeting that was put on by the San Diego Coalition, I think uh, called the San Diego Coalition for End of Life Options, I think is the name of the group. And uh, we were there, and, and we heard a, a very nice presentation by Jean Marie uh, Breadsticky. And, and she's here, isn't she? Yeah, there she is, come on up here. We, we, we want you at the, uh, at the table. Yeah, we want you at the table. Okay. And, uh, and Jean Marie uh, gave a, a really nice presentation on death doulas. And um, we, you know, we're both, uh, Faye and I both came out of the meeting thinking, you know, that would be kind of interesting to have our, our organization here about some of these end-of-life helpers that are sort of, um, you know, in some ways almost unorthodox uh, in the sense that they're not standard healthcare professions. Uh, and yet uh, they've become extremely uh, common and useful um, uh, functions that uh, need to be played out in the, in the American healthcare system, which has become so fragmented. Uh, you know, between HMOs and PPOs and Medicare, and there's all these little nooks and crack crannies that have developed in the system. And I think what you find is these end of life helpers. And we have three uh, categories of folks we're going to hear from today uh, a geriatric care manager, uh, a, a death doula, and a patient advocate. Uh, and these are all people uh, who work in these in some ways, nooks and crannies uh, uh, that you find in the healthcare system, uh, their work is incredibly important. And um, I think people, uh, as we approach closer to the end of life, we need to know about these people. Not that we, uh, and Hemlock doesn't recommend, we're not recommending anybody here, uh, or recommending any, any one of these professions, but, but I think it's important we all know uh, about these professions and we all know about these functions and that there are people out there who do them and do them really well and contribute. So that's our goal today. Is to, uh, we have one last uh, speaker uh, and if you can hang in there for another 15 or 20 minutes you'll hear about a profession, a uh, vocation that I've heard about since I've hung out around Hemlock. It's a death doula and the term itself is always interesting to me. What? hell is a death doula, I thought when I first heard the term. And uh, Jean Marie uh, uh, Bredstedy gave us a wonderful presentation at San Diego Coalition for End of Life Choices. So I'm hoping she can tell us in, in 20 minutes what, what <laughs> the death doulas really do. So you'll know too. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to see if I can. Um, I'm going to see if I can get a little more mobile here. Uh, if, if the slides come up, that would be fantastic. Um, so who else here has heard about or heard of death doulas or something similar? Wonderful, wonderful. Okay. I know there was actually a, an article in the Union Tribune a couple months ago that um, mentioned the profession at least and um, interviewed uh, Anita, who's, who's actually here in the audience today. Um, so, so that brought a little more exposure, at least locally, uh, which is wonderful. And you'll see the, uh, the title of the presentation has, has the words end of life doula. Uh, you'll also hear end of life guide. That's what I actually call myself. Um, and the, the idea of the, uh, the doula you know, comes from the birth doula movement. Who, who's heard of a, a birth doula? That's that's a lot more commonly known now, I think. But but they had it. They had an uphill road also to um, to come to some kind of professional recognition and sort of a, a regulation of their of their profession as well. So go ahead and advance to the to the next slide, if you please. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit today about what we do, what we don't do. Uh, a little bit about how we're compensated as well, and, um, and when you might want to call uh, an end-of-life doula or guide. I'll go ahead and advance to the next slide. 
So some of our roles, um, we provide non-medical support, holistic support. Uh, so emotional, spiritual, and, um, and practical support as well. So anything from making phone calls or being the go-between uh, when you're having trouble communicating with your hospice team or with your doctor. Uh, also facilitating end-of-life discussions with family. Um, I myself, in, in this work, have found that that's what people need the most. I've been called upon to lead family discussions and kind of um, be the listener and the key sort of, um, you know, when you hear what those questions are, you can then ask the questions that are going to lead you, uh, you know, to, to what the plan needs to be then. So that's, that's a big part of what we do. Um, we can educate people about what their options are. Um, my background is in hospice care, and so I personally know a lot about uh, what hospice does and doesn't do, and so when people need help understanding that, uh, that's, that's something I know a lot about. Um, as well as, as other, other choices that come up at the end of life, too. You know, um, every, everything you guys are concerned about, like, uh, what does it mean if I have a feeding tube, or what happens when um, my mom with dementia can't swallow anymore? Uh, you know, they're trying to push us to do this or that, and I don't think I don't think she wants that, or she said she doesn't want that. So, how do we how do we figure out what we can and can't do? So the ed <coughs> the education piece is a big part of that. Um, again, you know, fostering communication leading those, those family discussions and helping people understand um, you know, what, the, uh, what the options are. Um, bridging the gaps in care. Um, I think we all understand, and, and I think you know, our previous speakers here too have touched on the idea that, uh, you know, that the healthcare system right now is is geared toward one goal, and that's kind of to, to make money and to deny care, and um, so you end up with a lot, of, uh, a lot of disconnect between what you need and what you're gonna get from those healthcare professionals. Um, a, a big thing that came up in hospice a lot for me was, what do you mean you're not gonna be there 24 hours a day, or I need someone with me while I'm dying, I need someone to hold my hand, or to um, you know, go out and do the shopping so my daughter can be here holding my hand or something like that. Well, the, the healthcare professionals don't provide that. But you can have someone who is not in that realm come in and do that for you. So that's what I mean by bridging those gaps in care. Um, and ultimately also, we want to empower individuals and families in their own care. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Thanks. So some things we don't do or shouldn't do. Um, we don't provide direct clinical care or give medical advice or guidance. We don't undermine communication or relationships. You know, if you feel like you have someone, uh, you know, a caregiver in your midst who is not helping the situation by by doing that kind of undermining, you might want to reevaluate their, their presence there. Um, and we don't undermine the activities of the clinical care team. Uh, ideally, we're working with we're working with individuals really at end of life. So that that actually too is a distinction between uh, end of life doulas and and the other professions present. Uh, we are generally working with people right at the end of their lives and. Um, and hopefully they are in hospice, and you know we're we're not there to uh, to say oh you're giving too much morphine or you're doing this or you're doing that no 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 uh, that that should uh, that shouldn't be happening at all and um, and we don't impose our beliefs and I think again that reflects back on on what these ladies have said that uh, you know we're there to support what you want to help you figure out maybe what you want as well. Um, but not to uh, not to impose anything at all. 
uh, ultimately our goal is to foster healthy working relationships between everyone who is part of your care. Go ahead. I have a, I have a little uh, Venn diagram here. <laughs> uh, so these are some of the roles. Um, I know that the print is a little small, so um, we, some of these we can do. Not every end of life doula does everything, but these are some things that we can do. And again, it goes back to really um, interviewing the person before you bring them onto your team to see if they're going to meet your particular needs, or if they're going to be able to connect you with someone who can. And that's actually a big part of what we do too. And you know, I'm really happy to, to meet these ladies here today because I might you know, find myself in a position of saying, you know, you really need a, a care manager, or you really need a, um, you know, an advocate who, who knows this stuff and can, can help you so I can connect you with those people. So we do uh, help with advanced care planning. Um, we can connect you with clergy or spiritual advisors. We can sit vigil with a dying person. So that's something that uh, isn't often provided by either private caregivers or hospice care. You know, but if you need someone, if you don't want to be alone while you're dying, uh, that's, that's what an end of life doula can do. Um, we act as hospice volunteers. We can provide bereavement services if we are um, you know, qualified to do so. Uh, we can provide home funeral services, again, if we're, if we're qualified to do so. Um, practical household support services, so that's what I was saying, like making phone calls um, and, uh, you know, su supporting, supporting the household activities so that your family and you can be focused on your dying process and you know I can be in the background sort of taking care of all the little details that are gonna um, you know go by the wayside during that time and also to be the respite caregiver so you know and, and these these things can take place in any setting I want to add that too you could be dying you know ideally a lot of us want to die at home if that's not possible and you're in the hospital you know, we can be there at the hospital as well, and hopefully, um, you know, providing good uh, good rapport and communication with the with the hospital care team. So go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Uh, these are some of some of us here in San Diego. I don't have photos of everyone, but some of these ladies are here in the audience today, actually, as well. Um, and go to the to the next slide, which just has the next slide just has a few names and some. Um, some of the, uh, <clears throat> the trainings. So um, when you would want to call an end of life doula, sometimes the dying person asks for it. Um, they may not know what the name is. I have had some folks call me and say, oh yeah, I, I found you because you know, they, they want, you know, this person wanted uh, a, a death doula and, um, you know, but they might not know that name but they might say, you know, I, I need some extra help, so please find someone. Um, if you observe a need for the continual presence of a support person, um, that would be a time to call. Someone needs some preliminary information about what to expect at end of life. Maybe they've just received a terminal diagnosis, or um, you know, they, they know that they're close to the end, and they, they don't know what, uh, what to expect, so that might be a good time to call someone who can come in and, and have, a, have a discussion. Um, and also if they need some information about what happens after you die, um, you know, what the options are for funeral services, body donation, you know, there's, there's no need for us all to get caught up in the, you know, traditional, uh, you know, funeral industry, um, I, I could I could go on I could, that's a whole other presentation actually. Um, so there are a few uh, different trainings and resources that are out there nowadays. Um, the sort of newest and latest one is the National End of Life Doula Alliance. I believe they are starting to work on some sort of official certification. Um, 
So whatever tr various trainings that we all have will hopefully be incorporated into that and they can evaluate what, you know, the content and the, the curriculum and, um, and decide whether it meets the, you know, whatever standards that they come up with. The International End of Life Doula Association, they've been around for a while um, doing trainings. There's actually a training in San Diego next weekend, is that right? I think it now that does like a two or three day weekend training and then you also undergo um, a, a process of, of like documented practicum and then after that process they will certify, you know, give you their certification. Um, and then some others, doula givers, quality of life care, all these various associations. And so yeah, uh, much like the advocate uh, role, there is not currently a, um, a recognized certification or, a, or an accredited certification for end-of-life doulas uh, that may come about at some point. Um, but again, that, that's going to have to be you know, a, a long process of deciding which trainings are eligible for certification and one thing and another. So, you know, um, that we'll keep an eye on that, keep you informed. So, what's on, what's on that last slide? Oh, no, nope, not quite there yet. Uh, oh, maybe this is the last slide. No. And I, I apologize, my formatting got a little messed up in translation here. Uh, so yes, we, we usually do a fee for service, um, not covered by insurance. Um, sometimes we do uh, services as volunteers through a hospice organization. Um, some, you can ask, you know, if you, if you are involved with a hospice, you can ask whether they provide a vigil volunteer or I think Sharp calls theirs uh, 11th hour volunteers where they're supposed to be there with you continuously for a long period of time. Um, some, some of us actually do provide other professional services. I've actually been a massage therapist for 25 years. Some of us are Reiki therapists. Some of us are certified home health aides. So depending on what our individual qualifications are, we may actually be able to provide additional services as well. And you know those would be billed accordingly. Um, and you would just want to clarify what that is when you when you hire the person, you know, and make sure you know what their um, what their rates are and, and everyone's agreeable to that. Um, let's see, I kind of covered that already. So, um, and I, I just want to I just want to finish by saying, you know, there are several of us in San Diego now. I've actually got a list on the table in the back with our names and contact information. And we're not really, um, you know, we're not a collective of any kind at this point, but we do know each other and cooperate. And uh, for instance, I was on vacation this summer and I got a phone call from someone who needed a, a death doula and I was able to connect that person with someone who was, was actually in town at the time. So, you know, it's, uh, it's possible to kind of put together some, some coverage that way as well. So, I think that's, that's about it. I'll, I'll wait for your questions. Lisa uh, Barry Blackstone, she has been a patient advocate before you probably even knew there was such things, certainly before I knew there was such things. She's been doing this for 29 years. And uh, she uh, is uh, got a wealth of experience as a patient uh, advocate, and so I'm gonna let her tell you what uh, a patient advocate does, at least uh, what she does. And one of the things I think you'll see as we look at this, uh, these three uh, professions slash vocations, because you can see there's there's kind of a, an element of each in these uh, work, the work these folks do. But one of the things I think you'll see is there's a lot of overlap here. And so you have to begin to think what are the sort of the core differences between uh, a patient advocate and, uh, an, uh, you know, what, what used to be called a, a geriatric care manager, but no longer is. 
um, and, and, and then uh, death doula. So uh, keep that, that kind of in mind. And, and without any further um, introduction, I'm going to let Lisa Barry Blackstone come and tell us about her work as a patient advocate. Thank you. I, I'd like to thank Barry and the Hemlock Society for inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to talk to you about patient advocacy. The field of patient advocacy formally came into being only after the passage of the Affordable Care Act in 2010. And it, what the emergence of the field was a direct result of even though theoretically people were getting universal health care coverage, it became more complicated and more expensive to get the care that you needed and to have that be paid for by your insurance. So that's the driving force that led to the emergence of the profession, even though I had been doing it unofficially since 1990 in my capacity as an estate administrator. All of my clients were seniors um, in the LA Basin area, and when I applied to college a long time ago in 1978, I applied as a pre-med, thinking I wanted to go into medicine, but my advisor was a woman who was so frazzled and constantly being pulled into directions of the hospital she worked for, her children, their, her nanny, her husband, that she really scared me off of becoming a doctor. <laughs> and I have to say that seeing what doctors go through now to practice under the new rules of healthcare, I'm extremely grateful that I did not become a doctor. Um, I have doctors talk to me off the record all the time about had they known that they would never be able to be in private practice and would be under the thumb of a hospital administrator or a medical practice, they never would have gone into medicine. So how many people have heard of a private patient advocate before? Oh, more than I thought, that's great. So I, I am based in Ventura County, although I do have a national practice, and I do travel the country. There are only a few hundred patient advocates operating in the country. Most of them became patient advocates after the passage of the Affordable Care Act. And while I've never met a patient advocate whose intention is not noble, and wanting to truly help people navigate healthcare, the maze that it's become, as well as the problems associated with insurance, both public coverage with Medicare and Medi-Cal, as well as private insurance. Uh, the need for patient advocates is growing tremendously, but what I have found is that the only way to truly know how to be an effective advocate is to learn it by working in the trenches with your clients. The rules of healthcare have changed. They're changing all the time. And I find, um, I offer a range of services from helping people proactively with advanced healthcare planning, explaining to them why an advanced healthcare directive is not enough for you. You need more than that. You need a HIPAA release. I recommend, I saw on the table in the back, there is a pulse, a physician's order for life-sustaining treatment. Um, and as well as any additional wishes that Rebecca had referred to in your own personal statement. Choosing the right agent for you is incredibly important because usually people name a close family member who becomes understandably <coughs> upset and emotional when you're in a situation where you need your wishes advocated for. So there, there are a range of services that patient advocates provide. No advocate is the same. Everyone's background is different. Um, I suggest to people, because there is no national licensure yet for an advocate, it's extremely important that people vet them. And good ways to start is if they are legitimate business people, they will have a website. 
They will have proof of professional liability insurance that they will offer you. And they should have online as well as personal references that they're willing to give you. So I always offer those and uh, I'm just amazed. I never thought when I began working in 1990 as an estate administrator that I would become an advocate. But over the course of working with seniors and staying with some of them, actually most of them, through the end of their lives, I, it was just an incredible honor for me to be trusted to be with them and to go through this journey. So I have a, a information sheet that includes my name and contact information as well as my website, my email, and my phone number. I've got a little basket of magnets if anybody wants to take a magnet to stick that to their refrigerator. And I'm also a writer and I have uh, just complimentary if anyone's interested. I published this 10 years ago, uh, my first Soul Sherpa guidebook that explains how it is I came up with the name of my practice as well as the forces that drove me there because it was long before the passage of the Affordable Care Act that this was a calling to me. Um, I, my father uh, died very young at 62, 70, um, 17 years ago from uh, metastasized small cell lung cancer. Uh, that was a lesson in how unprepared we were as a family to deal with end of life and how you're never too young to take care of your advanced planning and get your team in order. Because in the event that you happen not to be fortunate enough to pass in your sleep as all of us would love, having the right team assembled before you need it is invaluable. Not only does it honor your wishes, but you save your loved ones a tremendous amount of stress and anxiety. And while we all like to think that hospitals and nurses and doctors are able to do what they have been trained to do for us, the very unfortunate reality is the Affordable Care Act being so heavily lobbied by the healthcare industry uh, spent $1.2 billion on Congress in 2010. The final format that the law took was very different from the piece of legislation that left Barack Obama's White House and went up to Capitol Hill. The amount of negotiation was tremendous. One of the things that fell through the cracks, I think it was very deliberately but well orchestrated, was that um, there are no, no price caps on healthcare prices. So whether you have Medicare, Medi-Cal, Medicare Advantage, or private insurance, your insurance is worth less every year because prices are going up, deductibles are going up, um, co-insurance, it, it's really become a business. Healthcare has become a for-profit business in this country, and even if you're insured through a government program, the reality is the money that is taken in through tax dollars to support that healthcare system has been plummeting. Millennials are far fewer in number than baby boomers, they're paying a lot less in taxes, people are living longer, and what happens every year is coverage continues to narrow. So patient advocates who are knowledgeable not only in what is happening to people physically and sometimes cognitively, where you know we have issues of dementia and Alzheimer's, where if a person lives to be 85, there's a one in two chance that you're going to develop a memory issue. That's just a fact. And as a matter of fact, as I leave, when I leave here today, instead of going back home, I'm going to be taking a flight up to Reno, where I have an uncle who I'm very close to, who was just diagnosed with dementia. And we're having a family meeting over the course of several days, trying to get ducks in a row and not let the healthcare system take care of my uncle, because the sad reality it is People who are in healthcare are overworked, they're underpaid, and they just cannot do the job the way they used to. 
So healthcare advocates are privately paid. We like it that way because if we were paid for by insurance, we would ultimately end up doing the bidding of an insurance company and not being able to represent you. The way that I like to work, and all advocates are different, and this is why vetting advocates is so important, um, is I charge a flat fee. Someone comes to me and says, I'd like help with my advanced healthcare planning. I would like help having this hip replacement surgery. I need someone to help me get prepared for it. Uh, be with me at the hospital to make sure I'm not being discharged too soon making sure that when I am discharged, I have all the proper medical equipment, which requires a doctor's order, as well as therapy orders, because once you leave the hospital, if you don't have that, you're out of luck. You cannot go back to a hospital. Um, it's very important to understand that hospitals, while they fall into two categories of nonprofit and for-profit, the reality is, all hospitals are in business to make money. The only difference is that not-for-profit hospitals do not have to pay tax on their profit. So it's incredibly important to understand that it has, healthcare has become a business. I, I never imagined it would be, but this is the reality. Um, I, I also help people with medical billing <coughs> negotiation. I like to price my services so I know that if I don't save someone at least as much as the fee that I am charging, then that is not a case that I should be taking. And I most recently was able to save $300,000 off of a hospital bill, a tax-exempt hospital, who had an elderly man there for congestive heart failure with no insurance, they sent his spouse a bill for $515,000. They expected her to pay it, referred her to a collection agency. Her daughter in Oregon reached out to me, and I was able to negotiate that bill down from $515,000 to $186,000. And that took about four hours of my time. So I, um, I do very, much like being connected to the people that I help. I feel that this is a real calling. Um, I am a certified palliative care counselor, so I do help people at end of life. Um, as Rebecca said, end of life is about what someone wants, not what I think they should want. I meet people where they are. People fall along all different lines on the spectrum. Some people are in complete denial until the time they die. It's too frightening, it's too uncomfortable. There are some people in the middle where they know, I should be dealing with this, but this isn't completely comfortable. And the minority of people that I've worked with and literally stayed with them through their death have been people who are at peace dying. Some of those people um, have made their own decision to accelerate their demise. That, that is their right. Patient advocates do not offer medical care. We do not offer medical advice. Our skill is we understand how the system works today and how different it is from 10, 15, 20 years ago. And it is going to continue to change. Hospitals are merging, they're becoming conglomerates. Same with insurance companies. Nobody really knows how all of this is going to end, but from what I know and what I can see, I don't see a very positive resolution to this. Uh, Medicare for all, in theory, is a wonderful idea. I don't think that healthcare should be a for-profit business, but the reality is if you paid healthcare providers, what Medicare approves, you would have a lot of healthcare providers going out of business, and the quality of care would be directly affected. So certainly what we're going through now is not an answer, but I think that it's a very simplistic um, proposition to say the problem, the issue is Medicare for all, that's our answer, that's all we need. 
So there is no such thing as a typical caseload for a patient advocate. Some people, if they are at end of life, or if they're in the middle of a very serious diagnosis, they require more time and energy than a client who I may not even necessarily meet who says, can you please help me evaluate these different insurance plans? I don't know what to look for. There are tricks in all of them. I don't know how many of you have been through the analysis of what the difference is between Med Medicare A and B traditional coverage and Medicare Part C, Medicare Advantage. There are huge differences, huge differences. And I'd be happy to speak to anybody afterward, after the, the formal session is over, because a lot of people get hooked into low premiums only to find out that their benefits are much more narrow and their co-payments are going to kick in a lot sooner under a less expensive plan. Um, I try to balance my work working with clients about half and half working with them um, on site, whether it's in their home, their office, a healthcare facility, or a hospital, and then working in my home office so I can focus on paperwork and medical billing and, uh, and not burn myself out because once you burn out, you're not effective and you have to be really on top of what's going on in healthcare. A doctor may make a recommendation to you and a hospital administrator may tell a case manager, that's not what we're doing, discharge this patient. And you see your doctor and an hour later you see your case manager and you find out your plan of care has completely changed. Um, I believe it's highly unethical. I believe it should be illegal, but the healthcare lobby is extremely powerful. Both sides of the aisle politically have taken money from the healthcare lobby, and I think the best protection people have is an independent advocate who truly understands how the legislation of the Affordable Care Act has allowed the business of healthcare to change. Um, I think I addressed the points that you asked me to, and so now, do I have about five more minutes? Uh, a few. A few, I just, I just yeah. want to add some personal stories to, to um, I know you're going to be overloaded with a lot of information, but a lot of people ask me how the name of my business came about. Um, I, my husband and I have been high altitude hikers for decades. And a lot of people still don't know what a Sherpa is. But Sherpas are, for those who don't know, are indigenous people similar to Eskimos, but they live in Nepal. And they are acclimated to living in high altitude. And they serve as guides for people hiking mountains. When I was with one of my estate clients uh, who was dying, he had been my client from the time he was 80, where my husband and friends uh, made fun of that and said, well, good luck with job security on that, Lisa. Well, my client lived to be 98 years old. And I had a lot of friends, including my husband, who had gone through a lot of layoffs and job transitions. And the bond that I had with this client was truly special and extraordinary. And I was the person that he wanted with him when he died. He did die in the hospital, and I stayed with him all night, um, which the nurse at the hospital had never seen before. And she told me, um, as my client was reviewing his life story, he just had to talk about his life and have someone witness that before he was ready to let go. I really felt as though I was helping him on this journey up to the top of the mountain. So his nurse said to me, when I'm sick in the hospital, I want to call you. What, what are you and, and what do you do? So it was only in thinking about that, that Soul Sherpa came to me and it has a strong significance and that's hence the name of my business. And the last thing I want to say is I made the transition from being an estate administrator to an advocate 11 years ago, a full-time transition, after I underwent brain surgery for a very rare nerve disorder called trigeminal neuralgia, which causes electrical shocking 
on one side of your face because your fifth cranial nerve is compressed by an artery. And as it pumps blood up to your brain, it wears away the protective coating of the nerve until the nerve is like a raw wire, similar to if the coating around this wire were taken away. And you are shocked electrically. It's also called the suicide disease. I went through four different doctors before I was diagnosed properly. I had to fight with my insurance company to cover my neurosurgeon because he was out of network. But I did appeal, I did win. My neurosurgeon told me I was the only patient he ever had who won on an appeal, and would I be willing to help his other patients? I said yes, the dam broke. I never expected the Affordable Care Act to pass two years later, and here I am as a patient advocate in national practice. So um, I also have on the far back table a small guidebook that is complimentary, that tells the story of um, my elderly client, my father's uh, lung cancer, my own journey to what I concern, consider a privilege to be able to work with people, uh, keeping their quality of life, and once that's no longer possible, helping them live the rest of their lives the way they want to in light of a healthcare system that can prove very challenging. A lot of people in healthcare, I believe most of them, doctors, nurses, therapists, they want to do the right thing, but the system is controlled by forces that has more power than they do, and that's why advocates are becoming more and more essential. So thank you for your time. Rebecca Montagna, uh, Montagno, <laughs> and uh, and she is a uh, geriatric care manager, and uh, she has a, a wealth of experience in this area, and uh, she's got so a long list of credentials, uh, a PhD, MA, MBA, and a number of other credentials that I don't even know what they mean, but they're healthcare related uh, credentials and. And she's just a wonderful person to tell us about what geriatric care managers do and how they can be useful to us if, if we ever need them. So I think without any further uh, introduction, I'm just going to let uh, you know, Rebecca get started and tell us about what geriatric care managers do. Thank you. Thank you. that it looks like you have wonderful leadership that is transitioning into wonderful leadership. So congratulations to all of you. Um, it sounds like you have uh, some really great leaders with some innovative ideas, and that is uh, wonderful. Um, how many of you have ever worked with either a geriatric care manager or an aging life care manager? One, two, two people in this entire room. So we are a niche profession. Um, we were called up until about a couple years ago, geriatric care managers, meaning we worked with geriatric populations, so older adults over the age of 65. And then we found out a lot of people don't like the word geriatric. They don't like the word senior. They don't like the word elder. They are aging, as we all are, right? And not everybody over 65 needs our help. There are some people under 65 who maybe um, have some kind of a diagnosis that requires some additional assistance, whether it's from birth or you know, a trauma in life or um, just you know, some illness that comes about whether they're 40 or they're 80. So as an organization, the Aging Life Care Association decided that we were going to change our name from the National Association of Professional Geriatric Care Managers, which was a lot to say, um, to Aging Life Care Professionals. And each one of us determines kind of our own designation. Do we want to be an Aging Life Care Manager, an Aging Life Care Expert, an Aging Life Care Professional? So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to explain to you what it is that we do. I'm going to go over a couple of slides that just gives you some basics about us, and then I'll tell you how to find one of us if you need it and why you would need one. 
So if we could change to the next slide, please. Okay, well, I think I know what's on my slide, so I'll just keep talking till we catch up. So, aging life care professionals are um, either social workers, nurses, uh, gerontologists, or people in related mental or health professions. I am a weird combination of all of that. Um, I, my background is in rehab counseling, business, and human services with a specialization in geriatrics. When I got my PhD, there was nothing called aging life care management, just geriatrics. I had to stick with that one. Um, and then we all have a varying amount of, of education. Some of us have bachelor's degrees, others masters in our field. Um, I have a PhD. There's a few other of my colleagues who might have a PhD in nursing, for example. Um, so we have a vast array of, of education amongst us, but everybody is college educated. That is a, a professional care manager. Um, and we also have a variety of credentials that are post-education. And those were the letters that Barry was referring to that are after my name. So some of us are care manager certified, which means we go through NACO, we take a test, we um, are required to complete a certain number of CEUs, for that test, um, to continue with that credential, and uh, we have to submit those every three years. Some of us are certified, or I'm sorry, care case, certified case managers, CCMs, and that is a broader scope, and again, it's also a, a, a comprehensive exam and CEUs that are required every five years to keep up to date. And then there's others that are LCWs, so licensed social workers, and then advanced licensed social workers. So those are the four main credentials following the education. Um, so that's who we are. That's what you will find as a background for a aging life care manager. And then what do you expect from us? What is it that we do? Well, each one of us operates a little bit differently. Some of us um, are independent. I was a sole proprietor, had my own um, practice. It was just me, myself, and I for several years, and that's really hard to do without help. I have a partner now who works with me, um, and that's two of us in our practice, and we trade off and we assist one another. And then there's program other companies in our organization that may have six or seven care managers on staff. Um, so each one of us carries anywhere from 10 to 20 clients. And there we go. Um, and smaller organizations might have less clients because you know it's more difficult to manage everybody in that way. Um, our average hours per week vary on our clients. How much do they need? I have clients who I see twice a week, and I have clients who I see once a month. It really just depends where they are in their journey of life and what kinds of activities they need and what kinds of support systems they have outside of our relationship that can do other other things. Um, and then most of us, me included, are available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Because emergencies do not happen at two o'clock on Thursday afternoon. They happen at five o'clock on Friday, and they happen at 3 a.m. on Saturday. Right? So we are on call. So what does that mean? You have an emergency. Someone, your loved one has an emergency. You fall out of bed and hit your head and the ambulance is coming and you don't know what to do and you know, hopefully you have somebody there with you and they call us and we meet you at the emergency room. Right? Or you've gotten to the end of your medication and you realize you didn't fill it and oh my gosh, what am I going to do? I don't have anything tomorrow. You call us, we make the calls, we get that prescription to you or get you some low nerve pills as long as they're not narcotics, um, until we can get that medication, your medication updated. So lots of different, I mean, I could go on and on and on with examples of how we can help in emergency situations. Um, the nice thing about all of us, especially if we belong to the Aging Life Care Association, is we follow a very strict uh, standard of ethics um, and standards of practice. And we have to actually take some of the, our hours, our, our CEUs for our credentials on ethics courses to make sure that we are working in the best interest of our clients, that we are looking at our own values and not um, transferring our values onto the other person, that we are respecting autonomy, that we are acting in good faith for everybody that we work with, 
that we're learning about the changes in the bioethics community, um, such as end of life decisions. That has been one I just I just did my CEU report last week, and every year I had an ethics class on end of life. Not quite on purpose, but because it's, I mean, well, I guess it is on purpose because it's necessary, but I didn't even realize that until I was writing up the list of all the different classes I took to submit my, my renewal. So it's important that we follow those uh, standards of practice and ethical guidelines and that we are continually seeking additional education. Um, our service is not cheap. We are not covered by anybody. We are constantly advocating, however, with Medicare um, and with long-term care insurance to cover our fees because we have proven over and over again that we're with care management, we reduce costs. But in the meantime, if you want to hire a care manager, um, the average cost in California is about $100 to $250, depending where you live, per hour. In San Diego, the average cost is about $150 an hour. And most of, the co most of my colleagues, myself included, we charge on either a quarter hour or a six minute increment. So we really only charge according to what we do. So if you, if you call us, you are not automatically billed for an entire hour. If we talk to you for five minutes, guess what? If you're on my caseload, you get billed for a point one. So $15, okay? Um, so that's the nice thing about that. Uh, but it is expensive, and we work with you to minimize costs. We see what it is you can do on your own, what you need our help with, what it is that, you know, maybe your neighbor or your friend or your, you know, your cousin or your daughter or your son or whoever's in your life can do that would not impact that, that uh, cost to you. So if we could change to the next slide. These are our eight core areas of expertise, and I want to point out legal and financial. We do not provide financial services, and we do not give legal advice. But what we do do is we know the providers in the areas that we work, and we help to match you up with the person that would best serve your needs. Okay. Now all the other stuff, we actually do. So we help with health and disability, housing, family issues, local resources, advocacy, and crisis intervention. Um, so in those situations, um, health and disability, for example, we may attend doctor's appointments with you, help you to understand what your treatment plan is, help to coordinate the services that go along with those treatment plans, um, advocate for you with the doctor if there's something that the doctor needs to know about you that maybe he or she is just not getting because they're in doctor mode and not in person mode. Um, so we will do all that stuff. Um, family, if you're having a family conflict, lots of times we um, are part of the mediation process in helping your loved ones, your family members, know what it is you'd like to see have happen in your life. Um, there is a handout at the back of the room that has all of these eight core areas of expertise on it. If anyone wants to grab a copy, um, there's a few in the back. And if there's not enough and you needed one and you didn't get one, my card is back there and I'll be happy to email or mail you one. All right, next one please. So what do we do? We have four essential job functions. We assess what it is you need um, through professional support. We coordinate services. We monitor those services. And we advocate and educate. Our main goals are to improve your quality of life and provide peace of mind to you and your loved ones, knowing that there's somebody that is there to help you in those times of crisis or those times of need. Next slide, please. Um, so this is how we do that, professional support. We assess what's going on, we develop a care plan, we link individuals to services, um, we mediate conflicts, and we do crisis intervention. Those are the first steps. Once we know what it is you need, we link you to those services, um, we match you with the right person, we are always patient-centered, and we are the hub for communication. If we have linked you to someone and there is a concern and you don't have the information that you need to give them, chances are we have it. And so if we don't, we'll find it for you. So we are always a communication hub. You can call us anytime. Um, and then we make sure that those services are right for you, that people are doing what they promise to do. And if they're not doing what they promise to do, either we have a talking to them or we fire them. So you guys don't have to be the bad ones. 
All right? And then we monitor. We see, is there anything else that needs to be done? Do we need to make any changes or adjustments? Because guess what? We're humans. This is life. Situations change. Right? You might find that you need assistance from a caregiver, for example, four days a week, Monday through Friday, and then something happens, and for a short period of time, you might need eight hours a day. And then you get better, and we go back to four. But we help you to make those determinations. What is necessary and what is safe for you? And what is reasonable? Um, and all of this is done uh, by keeping you informed, keeping your professionals and your families informed, adding to that peace of mind, and then we are constantly evaluating and adjusting what we need to do. And then if we can move on, our biggest area of work is advocacy and education. So we help to make sure that those people in your life know what it is you want to do. I am a huge advocate for memorializing what you want. If only you know what you want, and you can't speak at some point in time and tell people what you want, guess what? They're gonna do what they want. And so when I meet with my clients after building a little bit of trust, I work with them to create a quality of life statement that details things you would not even think of that you want for the rest of your, your life and even your death. Who do you want to be there? What services do you want to be provided? How do you want them to provide it? What are the top things that are a priority to you? And we do that either in your handwriting or we video you, but we make it known that this is coming from you. They're not my ideas. They're not your friend's ideas. They're not your new spouse's ideas. They're not your oldest child's ideas. They're your ideas. That way, when it comes to any powers of attorney or any family members or any doctors or anybody else saying, I think this is what they should have, we will go back to that document and say, that's a great idea, but this is what this person wishes to have done. And we will advocate and educate the individuals that we're working with regarding that. So we support you through your individual journey. We educate your families. Um, to help them understand why you've made the choices that you've made and why you have the wishes that you do. Um, and we also educate healthcare professionals on person-centered decisions. Doctors are getting much, much better at looking at people holistically, but they still have a way to go. And they tend to work in silos, and I, nothing against doctors. They have a really difficult job to do in a very short period of time to do it. So we're kind of like the shorthand people. This is what's important to this person. How do we get there? Right? You have a diagnosis, you have a treatment, but this is still a person. This is what their wishes are. How do we get from your treatment plan to their quality of life statement in the quickest way possible that is safe for them? All right? And then we advocate for self-determination. So why would you hire an aging life care manager? It's any of these things. You might not have support to help you through these situations. Maybe you live here and your children live on the East Coast. Or maybe you don't want your children involved even though they live down the street uh, because you know they just have all their opinions and you know, you're just like, eh, I'm gonna do it my own way. Um, and so we're there for that. Um, so you need an advocate. Uh, you, have, you, know, you or someone you know has memory issues and maybe they're refusing help and it's becoming unsafe for them. And they need an objective neutral party to help them understand because you're just not the best person to discuss that with them because they think you're you know, being judgmental or it's just difficult for you or you have a num number of reasons. You have a confusion about your options. As Barry stated earlier, there's HMO, there's PPOs, there's healthcare advantage, there's prescription um, part D, there's this, there's that, there's, you know, where do you go, right? If we don't know, we know the person who does know. We can get you that. Um, there's a crisis. Again, remember, 2 o'clock on a Thursday afternoon is a time for crisis. It's 5 o'clock on Friday or 3 o'clock on Saturday morning. Or any time in between. They do happen at all hours. But if you have a crisis and you cannot get to the individuals you need to because you know, they closed or they're not available, you contact your, your aging life care manager 
And I tell all of my clients, if you call and you get my voicemail, it means I'm with another client. But if you hang up and you call me again, I know that it's an emergency. And I will stop what I'm doing and I'll take your call. Now, an emergency isn't, well, my remote control won't work, right? But an emergency is, you know, I've fallen and I think I'm seriously injured and I need to go to the hospital, or I'm not feeling well, I'm having difficulty breathing, I need to go to my primary care physician. So many times we'll say, okay, hang up, call 911, and we will meet you at the house. And all of my clients know that their time is their time, but if there's an emergency, I may have to leave them and get to my other client, but guess what? When they have an emergency, they're gonna be receiving the same treatment and the same service. Um, and that's why I have another person, and you know, you'll never, you never get left stranded. We always have a backup plan to take care of you in those issues, situations. Um, and then family conflict. I have never met a family who does not disagree on something. And if any of you have a family where you get along every single day on every single issue, I would like to meet you. All right, we all have different ideas. So these are some of the reasons to hire us. And I'm gonna go through the next part really quickly. This is our website, and I was told we would not have um, internet access, so being the prepared care manager that I am, I screenshot, which I learned how to do today, by the way, um, a couple of different items just to show you really quickly. So we're gonna go through these really fast. So this is um, the homepage of our association. Um, right after you might be interested in is our standards of practice. So if any of you want to know what our standards of practice are, log on and read them. Now this orange button at the top that says find an aging life care expert. If you ever want to find somebody, here that's the button that you will hit. And when you hit that, it'll go to this page. And you, the best, easiest way to do this is enter your zip code. And do a 50, I always like to do a 50 mile search because you get a lot more options that way, and you can see more than just a couple of people. And you hit search, and we'll go to the next page, and you will see different care managers. So um, you can see Denise here has a BSN and a PHN, so she is a nurse. Miriam, who is my colleague and works with me, um, has a bachelor's degree in a CMC, right? And then underneath, you can see all the different um, practice areas that they have. Miriam, for example, does advocacy assessment, care management, consulting, etc. And you can also see how long they've been in the association. Miriam, for example, has been there since 2007, and Denise has been there since 2018. Right, so Miriam, although she has a bachelor's and Denise has more uh, education, their actual experience in the field might be quite different. And then if we scroll down, there's me and my colleague Betsy. And you can see from us, from between the two of us, we also have quite a, a different array of education and background. So we can skip down, because yes, we do have men that do our jobs too. And here are two of them, um, David and Kevin. So you can go through and um, you know search different things that are important to you. Some people would rather work with a woman. Other people would rather work with a man. Some people need, you know, would rather have a nurse, others a social worker. It's up, completely up to you. But what you want to do when choosing an life care, aging life care professional is make sure they're an alpha member because they do have those standards of practice. We do have some outliers out there that are wonderful people, but they're just kind of operating on their own and they're not being held accountable to our standards of practice. I don't know if they belong to other associations, but. Um, it's important to see that they're a part of the organization. You want to know that they're certified, what is their licensing, how responsive are they, how many years of experience do they have, how connected are they to the community that you live in, um, what services do they provide, and what are their fees, and how do they charge, right? Is it a quarter hour, is it a six minute increment, because that can make a lot of difference um, in your building. All right, and then, uh, when it comes to end-of-life options, our main goals are to respect the autonomy of the person. Your choices are your choices. Whatever I believe personally does not matter. It is up to you. We are here to advocate and respect what it is that you decide. Um, we want to advocate on your behalf to promote quality of life and dignity in dying. 
We are constantly participating in education and public policy. Our um, Aging Life Care Association actually has a public policy branch that we all um, get regular updates from. We're always looking for new resources and services. Um, so we really are keeping up to date on what is out there. Um, and we work in partnership with you your, and whomever you want us to work with, whether that's your family and friends, whether that's your healthcare providers, um, because we want to respect your wishes and achieve the goals that you have set out, okay? So it really is, you are the driver of the service, okay? And so we look forward to partnering with you. If any of you ever call any one of us, and myself or any of my colleagues, Sandy was very fortunate because we have about 30 care managers and believe it or not, even though we're all competitors to one another, we are also great friends. We get together once a month for education and sometimes happy hour, which is wonderful. Um, but we do really support one another. And if we find that you are not the right match for us, we refer to one another. So we really want to make sure that you have the, the right care manager that meets your needs. Thank you. One point I should make before anybody starts asking questions, because Ken always asked me to make this point. Uh, we videotape these conferences or these presentations and we also videotape the question and answer sections. So if you don't want to be videotaped uh, with your question, for some reason you want to, uh, don't want to be on tape, um, you know, better not raise your hand, better uh, write a question out and give it to somebody and let them ask it for you. Okay, so uh, first question. Uh, are there doulas all over the United States, and how many are there, and how many do, do we have in San Diego? I don't think that mic's on. Oh, no, turn it up. Testing, testing, testing. No. Nope. How many doulas are there in the I, United States, and how many in San Diego? Uh, I don't, the okay, the there, there, there are death doulas all over the United States, Canada, Australia, the, the movement is worldwide. I do not know how many there are currently in the United States. Uh, there are many that have been operating for many years sort of under the radar. Um, in San Diego, the list that I have, the list that I have on the back table, uh, I believe has six or seven people on it. But that may even not be comprehensive. Um, those, those are just who we know <laughs> amongst ourselves, sort of. So thank you. Yes. I think this fellow right here was next. Um, I, this question is for any, I, can you hear me all right? Uh, this question is for any one of you. Uh, uh, that mic is also, doesn't seem to be is it, working. Is it on? It was a, I don't know. We can repeat the question. Yeah, maybe it just needs to be loud. My voice is weak. Ah, anyway, uh, what happens if you have a client, you spent met much of the time with them, you got things set and you think everything is go, and then uh, maybe four or five months later, they call and they say uh, in, a, in a subsequent interview that they've completely changed their mind. They want to go in an entirely different direction, uh, uh, contrary to what they have previously agreed to. I wondered if you've ever encountered a, a, such a person, and what would you do if you did encounter such a person? So the question is, have we ever worked with individuals who have created a plan with us and maybe four months down the road come back and want something completely different? For me, the answer is absolutely. That, that does happen. Um, and it might happen for various reasons. Maybe there's a new person in that individual's life. Um, maybe they have obtained additional information. They're determining that they want to move closer to family. I mean, it could be for a multitude of reasons. Um, what we want to do, what I do in our practice and what aging life care managers do is we really do assess what is the reason. If it is a new person in their life, who is the person and what are the intentions, right? Because sometimes there are unfortunately a lot of predators out there and sometimes they're convincing people to completely change their wills and their trusts and their powers of attorney for um, bad instead of good. And so if that's the case, we are mandated reporters and are obligated to, to report that to Adult Protective Services. If they are determining that maybe they have, uh, or it's determined that you know they have had an improved 
um, health situation or they're moving closer to a family member or it's something of a more positive nature, then we um, will either assist them with that because again, life is life, we're all humans and it continually fluctuates, it never stays the same. So we would help with that. And if they just determine that, you know, aging life care management is just not the practice for them, that's not what they need at that time, um, for us, we would just, you know, uh, terminate the, the, the contract and the relationship with them. Um, many of us do charge a retainer, so the retainer would be refunded at full value, um, and we would just happily go our separate ways. Yeah, there's uh, 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 Beverly. Can you give us an idea as to the general fees charged by both the patient advocate and the doula uh, care manager, care, um, as, a, as that was a <laughs> Yes, my, my fees as a patient advocate, as I said before, is a flat fee, so which describes in writing uh, a scope of service. In general, um, most advocates, including myself, work on a sliding scale. I have taken homeless people as clients. Um, I have taken people with tremendous estates who actually want to overpay, and they say, take the portion that is extra and devote this toward your fund. But in general, my fees can range for a, a specified job that is going to be accomplished in a relatively short term, and by that I mean anywhere from a couple of weeks to a few months, as, as low as $350, maybe to as much as $7,000. But it really depends upon the nature of the work, how much of my in-person time is required, and, and very important to me is, does it make financial sense for someone to hire me because I do want to be able to save them more in terms of bills they're going to get as well as the ability to negotiate for services. So does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. And maybe that the Jean Marie can Yeah, I, I, can, um, uh, I can answer for myself that right now um, I'm charging $50 per hour, but again, if I'm working with someone with limited uh, means, I can do a sliding scale. Or if it's a situation where the work involved is mm, more intense, uh, I, I may, um, I may, you know, think about raising that. Or, or if I'm providing services like, you know, massage therapy on a regular basis, then I would be charging my massage fees, which are. are you know, more than that. I'm not sure what the other doulas uh, charge generally. Um, I have heard of folks charging upwards of 80 to $100 an hour and even more. Um, but I think, yes, Anita, thank you. I, I'll try to answer that. Doulas, like everyone else who's speaking, make sure you vet them because they have a wide variety of what they can and are capable of doing. But a lot of them come with package fees, so they have a flat fee for X amount of services, and then uh, additional services on top of that are at a, at a set rate, and then those rates can vary. But um, everyone should be having signed contracts so you know exactly what you're getting, what you're not getting. If you don't have a signed contract, then you're probably not with the right person, so make sure that you're, make sure you know what you're getting up front and um, there are no questions. Thank you. And, and did you want to oh. say a word more about your fees? You said, I think, something about yeah, your fees. Yeah, our, our to... fees range depending on the professional, but the average in San Diego is 150 an hour. We, some of us charge in six minute increments, others in quarter hour increments, so every 15 minutes is charged. Um, one thing I will say is uh, that, like the doula just mentioned, you really do want to have a contract with somebody that outlines how they pay, what their rate is, and what services they charge for. Um, that is very important. I have a, uh, there's a question. Oh, right over here. Let this. Yes. Yes. One hit. Yeah. There we we'll go. I have a, I know a number of people who are single, aging, no kids. They don't feel they have a close enough friend to have them handle their matters. 
So I'm wondering if any of you can serve as like a health care power of attorney, a health care representative, <coughs> for example, to decide if they need to go into a facility uh, to show up when they're going to be discharged from the hospital and help make sure they get to where they want to get, things along those lines. Okay, so legally, um, aging life care managers can only be powers of attorney for two non-related individuals. Um, many of my colleagues don't even want to do that. Um, I currently have two people, so I am full. Um, but what we do do is we do work with those individuals to still help them make those decisions and help identify someone that would work as a power of attorney um, for example, a professional fiduciary would do that, and then they are actually able to take on, you know, hundreds of people if they wanted to. I don't know if anyone could do 100 people, but they have unlimited um, availability for for power of attorney situations. And I'll answer that for um, death doulas, for end of life doulas. For your, we ethically should not take on more than two, also for health. The, for the healthcare directive, I personally do not take on for their financial stuff. I feel that's an um, ethical violation for me, myself, to take that on. I advocate for them to have someone else do that. That's a personal. Uh, Faye, I think, had a question. Yeah. Um, in my advanced directive, I say I don't want antibiotics and I don't want to be fed or hydrated if I have advanced dementia. And I'm just wondering who I can get to monitor that at the institution that I will be placed <laughs> uh, to make sure that doesn't happen. Uh, that's one reason why uh, patient advocates offer a service called patient accompaniment, and that means that we stay with you. Um, I personally, um, like Rebecca, available 24-7. Yeah. Um, obviously, I cannot work every single day of the year, but I, I was down in San Marcos last month um, at one of your hospitals uh, with a client and I stayed four days and four nights. Um, I personally, having seen the changes in how hospitals are run, where medical errors are on the rise and death from medical errors is on the rise, it's not because doctors and nurses are any less competent. It's because of the staffing decisions that are made by the administrators at hospitals and how much they are going to be spending in overhead and how much they'll keep in profit. I, I have found it while it, I've learned to sleep very well in a hospital, but there are some clients who I will not leave alone because things like that happen. Um, I wanted to add just, just quickly, on the bottom of my card, there, it gives, right under my Soul Sherpa logo, it gives two national organizations that I'm a member of. Um, the National Association of Healthcare Advocacy Consultants and the Alliance of Professional Health Advocates. If you Google both of those, you will be led to free national directories where you can search by website, um, by zip code and find advocates in different areas for different things that you might be looking for. And because patient advocacy is relatively new, um, those of us established in the profession do suggest you speak with more than one advocate. Any legitimate advocate will be willing to give you a complimentary telephone consultation with no obligation. Faye, to answer that question, aging life care managers would also help to ensure that your wishes per your advance directive are met. That's one of our, our primary questions when we do our, our assessment is to get your advance directive. Um, we carry a copy with you. We make sure all of the, your doctors and your hospital have a copy. Um, and when we go with you to the hospital, we have another copy that we make sure they know. So um, we're very much informed and advocating and educating on that exact issue. This is a question for, for, for Rebecca. <laughs> yes. Um, I believe my long-term life care, uh, my long-term health care insurance policy uh, designates that, I must, that there must be a geriatric care manager or a care manager if the policy is used. From what I heard you say, I thought that might not be the case. Can you so, straighten that? Yes. 
Every long-term care policy, so this is long-term care, not your medical insurance, but if you took out additional insurance for long-term care, they, most of them have a rider that there is a geriatric care manager involved. It's usually someone in that organization. Nine times out of 10, it is a care manager who works for your long-term care insurance company and they either do an interview with you on the phone or they contract with a nurse who will come out and assess whether or not your long-term care is um, activatable, if that's a word, if we can activate it based on the requirements. So it's a little bit misleading. There are some long-term care insurances that will pay for my services, but they are rare and far between. Um, Many times when I am working with clients who do have long-term care, I actually do meet with that nurse and help to fill out the paperwork and advocate that it gets started because there are, I mean, it's insurance. Their job is to not start a policy. My job is to get your policy started. And we do have long-term care advocates and actually the, they're listed on the, the uh, I know one who's listed on one of the organizations that was just mentioned. And she is a fighter. I mean, she will do everything to get your policy moving and started and getting the maximum amount of care for that policy that you need. So, um, yeah, that's, I hope that answers your question. Uh, is, can we get a microphone? Uh, who, somebody who has a question here? Yes. I'm a little confused. I thought this group what favored um, not extending lives that had no purpose and no positive, happy ending to coming at all. But all I'm hearing are ways to get more services, longer care, uh, more doctors, and they keep inventing all these gadgets that they can uh, hook you up to. It, that, it's just kind of going nowhere. Why can't somebody uh, suggest, in this group particularly, that recognize that, that some people just are not going to get better and, and not spend all these gazillion dollars on, a, on someone who's going to die in two days while a, an infant is, is suffering from whatever, I don't know. It just, I, I, don't, I don't get the priorities. Yeah, maybe that's a question for me to answer. And uh, I think the answer is uh, we are not advocating that you choose any kind of end of life helper because it may be your individual wish to speed your uh, life to its end as, as quickly as possible. Uh, you may decide uh, that in your case, but everybody's different and every single person, even in this group uh, that leans in the direction you're talking about heavily, uh, even in this group there will be very individual differences between what people considered to be intolerable uh, and when they would like to end their life. And so ultimately each individual has to make that choice and I think what these professions offer are, are this sort of individualized kind of uh, treatment, if you will, or individualized kind of help so that whatever you choose to end your life, that that time as you approach that point is as much like you want it to be as possible. Um, and I think uh, it's, we, we need to be very clear. We're not, we're not advocating in any way you choose any of these sorts of end of life helpers. It may be that in your case you don't have any need for them. Maybe in your case you don't want any of that kind of extension of help. But it, it may be that you find yourself in a situation alone, oftentimes families in, in this country are spread all over the place, you're alone. And, 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 and so you may want to end your life as soon as possible, but, but you may need some help till you get to that point. And so I think that's really what we're about. Remember, we're about choice, individual choice at the end of life. And that's really what we're talking about here. You're the first person to mention choice. Well, uh, yes. I don't have much of a question as I have a comment. Um, 
I was a caregiver for my mother for 14 years, from the age of 91 to 105, when she passed away. And as I was listening to this today, I did all of those things, all by myself. I have no siblings, I'm married, um, and as her health declined, so did mine. <laughs> because I had to physically move into the nursing home with her to not necessarily extend her life, but to provide what I thought was um, just acceptable, not extraordinary, but acceptable care after she broke her hip and it was uh, repaired at 101. And then to oversee the physical therapy and so forth and so on. And as I was sitting here today listening to this, you know, it isn't always for us that these services will be provided as we're dying, but it also might be for a family member or a loved one. And um, I, I know how difficult it was to do all that. And it really, really took a toll on me. Yeah. And, and so I just wanted to kind of mention that, that maybe we should kind of broaden our perspective about for whom these services are really being offered, yeah. not just for the patient. Yeah, that's a very good point. I'm glad you remind us of that. I think uh, Rebecca wanted to comment on it. I just want to make one comment about that. I mean, as, as people are becoming caregivers, um, you lose sight of what your real role is, whether that's daughter, wife, husband, sister, you name it, right? So our goal, I think, and all of us would agree with this, our role is to allow you to continue to be the daughter, the wife, the sister, the husband, the brother, whatever role that is, and let us do the heavy lifting so that you can enjoy those last days or hours or whatever it is. Um, and to the other lady's comment over here, I just wanted to say our role is not to prolong. Our role is to make sure that people understand and respect what your decisions have been. That's what our roles are. There was somebody back in the back. Uh, is AB 15 still in effect or is it still on hold? SB 15, right to die? Oh, uh, no, it's, it's been uh, the uh, appeal court ruled that the uh, uh, law, oh, let me, I guess I should. <laughs> the, 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 the state court of appeal uh, just uh, about a month ago ruled that that uh, law should be valid, still valid, and uh, uh, my expectation is that ultimately the people who lost, the people who brought the suit trying to invalidate the law, will appeal that decision. And uh, so uh, in the long run, we're uncertain about where that law is going to end up. But at least currently and for the foreseeable immediate future, it's, it's in place and you do have uh, legally the right to die according to the, the law as it was passed by the legislature in 2015. Thank you. 2015, yeah. You have a question right here. Yeah, I wanted to get a little more information about this whole issue of the healthcare agent uh, in terms of healthcare directives. Now that person is supposed to represent us if we are not able to make our own decisions. So usually that would be we're in a coma because of end stage disease or more, more likely that would be statistically as we have gone into dementia. And Many people don't have a person within their immediate family, at least living nearby, that can do that. So it does present a big dilemma. I'm trying to figure out, you mentioned a financial fiduciary. I'm thinking of somebody in a bank going to leave that office. So if you could just explain a bit more, and also kind of the ethical issues of how are they going to get paid, and are they going to get paid more if they back extend our lives when that's not what we want? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. You want to answer that? Yeah. Lisa? With a background in state administration, I'm asked very often uh, by people who don't have family close by or people, friends, good friends, who just can't assume the responsibility. The, the code of ethics for patient advocates is it is a direct conflict of interest to serve in more than one capacity. But the way that I've been able to help people, um, because I have, speaking to this lady's point, I have had people contact me from across the country saying, I just saw the most incredible thing is happening to my friend. He didn't have any advanced planning. He has dementia. 
This is not what he wanted, but he's been stuck in a skilled nursing facility. So I want to hire you to meet with me and my attorney because my family members who have been named as my primary and alternate agents, I don't trust that they have the strength to let me go the way that I want to be let go. So what is ethical and allowed for patient advocates, especially those who understand all the legal and financial and insurance and personal wishes of people is when a family member or a trusted loved one is named as the agent, in the directive, they are instructed to consult with my client's patient advocate, who is me. So I'm not making any decisions. I'm not, I'm not making the decisions for the healthcare providers. I'm not charging any money, but I can explain to the agent, regardless of where they are logistically, this is what your loved one does and doesn't want, and this is what it means in the context of how care can be offered to them, extended, not extended. Um, the home, a homeless man who I took on a couple of years ago was from Portland, Maine, and found out at 58 years old that he had a terminal cancer. And his reaction was, well, if I have a terminal cancer at 58, forget these winters in Maine, I'm going to Southern California and I'm going to live out the rest of my life. Well, he, was, he wasn't homeless before he got sick, very sick, but he didn't have supplemental insurance. So the hospice agency that was assigned to help him basically let him left him high and dry because they were not, they are a business and they weren't going to collect a full insurance reimbursement. And one of his former co-workers in Portland, Maine called me and said, my friend is terminal, he's living in his van, he has no advanced care planning. I told her if he can get himself up to see me from Huntington Beach in his van, I'll take him on as a pro bono client. But paperwork was enacted where she as the friend was designated as the power of attorney but she simply gave me written instructions. He was pro bono, so I didn't collect anything, but there are ways that you can make sure that someone who can legitimately be named as your agent can consult, I think really with any of us, who would be able to explain what that means and make sure that no one in the healthcare system is speeding up your wishes or slowing them down.